Okay, Madam Chair. Okay. Welcome to the November 5th, 2020 uh, Zoning Board of Appeals of the Village of Mamaroneck meeting. Uh, you are on Zoom. You should all be able to have access. Now, I want to say something, and I apologize for this, but haven't been able to fix it. My voice does not match my the video of me. So you will see, hear me speaking, but you will not see a matching movement of the lips or movement if I move my head. It doesn't match, and I apologize if it's disconcerting. It's very disconcerting to me. But um, so far, the technology people have not been able to fix that problem. Uh, so this is a Zoom problem, so I apologize in advance, but we can proceed anyway. I, you can hear me and see me. Okay. Applicable. So we're let it, we're going to open the public hearing for tonight, and the first item to be heard on the public hearing is Case Two SP Twenty Twenty Four Nineteen Mamaroneck Avenue. Is the applicant here? That's Roaster Cafe. I don't, Chair, I, I don't see the applicant. Um, I sent him the information. I don't see him. So if you'd like to move on. Okay. We will move on to um, item public hearing number two as listed on the agenda. Case number 5A, 600 Lorraine Street for variances. Is the applicant here? Good girl, come on, Lou. be good girl. Good evening. Good evening. No, Lou, stop. Robin? Yes. Um, before we hear from the applicant, I thought we had corrected a couple of things in the um, notice of violations. Could I just bring up those points so we know what it is? Wait, wait. are you talking about for a uh, roaster? No, I'm talking about 600 Lorraine Street. Notice of violations? I don't recall there being any, you mean- I know, but sorry, the notice of the need for variances. Oh, okay, go ahead. Well, for instance, the lesser side yard is 5.8 feet. And the combined side yard here, they're saying is 8.5, which would make that one of the yards two point something. So obviously something's off in the map. As I understand it, we clarified that since it's a corner lot, the applicant has two side yards. And so the combined yard setback is fine. It's over um, 14 feet. So I think that, that I thought we had clarified that. And also when it came to the off street parking, are we still trying to figure out whether or not that was not uh, grandfathered in? Um, did we need to clarify that? I thought we had thought that it didn't require variance because it was a grandfathered in use of two spaces. You are correct. We certainly made that. I think we made that determination on the parking that they have had already, or that they had the same, this number of parking spaces since the beginning of this use. Yes. I think the and issue was, I think the question that nobody knew whether that was correct. I don't know that we determined that who was the correct number, except that they have a C of O for the two family house, which would presume that the parking was appropriate. Otherwise they couldn't have gotten a certificate of occupancy okay. and therefore I think we have to assume that it was legally established at the beginning and therefore it is part of the non-conforming okay. use. And, and then when it gets to the combined side yard, you can see the math is off. If, if the lesser one is 5.8, but that combined with another side yard is 8.5, then the lesser side yard couldn't possibly be 5.8. But I also believe that the two side yards together um, satisfy the minimum. So I, I don't think that, that there is any variance required for the combined side yards. I thought we the, the issue came up. I know the issue came up. Um, and I thought, give me a second, unless someone else recalls, I wanted to look at this. I'm just pulling up the map. 
So as I understand it, there's two side yards. Right. Correct, because it's a, it's a corner lot. That's correct, but. So we need to add the 5.8 to the other dimension. I'm looking at the, well, that's the, that's the, It's at the very end, I believe, at the original application. No, no, I'm looking at the map, but that's not there. I'm looking at the um, revision. So they have eight feet, six inches on one. I'm looking at the revised application and they have six feet on the other. And that is- 14 and a half. Except they have something that goes into the, it says 5.8 feet. 5.8 feet, not six. And there's a portion of that that is less than 5.8 feet. It shows, mm -hmm. so it's a little confusing. Let's see, side six. Let's go. Um, well, he definitely, the applicant definitely did ask for a variance for the lesser side yard being at the, you know, maybe the dimensions off a couple inches, but I'm talking about the co combination. No, no, I understand, but I'm looking at what they have and to what okay. the combined, sorry. Um, they um, were proposing, so it was the rear yard we determined it did not apply because it was originally they had a rear yard um, in there. And right. it says side yard six feet, the sum is 14. Now they're showing, yeah, 5.8 feet. The lesser side, that was what it was. The lesser side yard is 5.8 feet. So as if they need a variance for the lesser side yard. Yes, but they have it listed. I believe it says it's listed both the lesser side yard and the combined side yards. Am I wrong? Um, so they only need for the lesser side yard, correct? Yes. They don't need for the combined because combined. the combined looks right. like it is 5.8 plus 8.6, which is more than 14. Right, right. So so we should just, uh, we mm -hmm. should take off, we could cut out those needs for those variances. Correct, and so they, they only have, they need three variances. Lesser side yard, expansion of non-conforming structure, and um, increase in FAR, floor area ratio. Correct. Okay. Thanks, Meg, for <laughs> catching that. I don't think anybody's going to disagree with two tenths of a foot variance. Um, okay. So, um, Mr. Taylor, would you like to speak? You want to describe the change you made in your application? Um, after the last meeting? Sure, so during the last meeting, um, the concern was being 15% uh, or more over the FAR. And you uh, wanted to see if that's something that I would agree to um, as far as uh, reducing it. So looking at it, bringing the FAR below 15% over uh, would reduce the addition by 90 square feet. At the end of the day, from 2818 down to 2728. So I had a conversation with the contractors um, as well as the architect. Looks like the cost of construction, regardless of the reduction in 90 square feet, is about the same. Uh, so from our perspective, if that's something that is approved, then we, we are okay with that as well. Well, you're going to have to ask Greta about that one. I think Greta was the one that said 15% over or more was considered, you know, a, a substantial increase. So that's why we settled on below 15%. And what's the percent now? Percent now was 18 uh, point something. I don't remember the exact, I could probably do the quick math, but I believe it was 18 point, let me just do the quick math. Would you say the square footage is now two seven what? So it'll be two seven two eight. Because the plan, I looked at the, I didn't see, I, I'm looking at the revised application and I didn't see that in there at all. I'm, I, so I'm a little confused because I don't see. see it in the revised application unless I looked at the non-revised application. Let me go back to the well, application. The, the revised application that we submitted, um, I guess the last time, was the change in the variances. 
because originally when we came here, um, we were told we had certain variances that we need to apply for. Then we came back um, after research was done and we needed to have X amount of variances. So when we had the revised application, they included those additional variances. Um, okay. The so, only thing I, I was asked between now and then was just that perspective. Okay, so if you reduced your square footage, where would you reduce it from? How would your the configuration of your building look different with 90 square foot feet less of floor area? It's 13%. So, all right, so let me, let me, I guess, address your, your question. So it would come off of the back part of the addition. So the 90 square feet would come off of the back part. So instead of going all the way to the back of the house, as far as the addition is concerned, it would be, I guess, four feet further in from the back of the house. And which is the back of the house? The, sorry, the part that is Per parallel to Lorraine Street or parallel to Jefferson Avenue? So parallel to parallel to Lorraine. Okay. It was parallel to Lorraine. Okay. I was, so I was wondering about the, this. Right. So it's where the setback is 8.5, I guess. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Yep. So that's what it would look like. Let me if I can pull it up. But that cutback, the question is that cutback is on the second floor, not on the first floor. Is that correct? Correct. We're not going to change the original, you know, form of the house. It would be right. off of the second floor addition. That's correct. right. So the first floor would still be eight foot five, or is it five foot eight? Whatever. Doesn't yeah, matter. Be, yeah, it would be eight, eight foot five. That's correct. Right. Okay. So you, you you reduced it from fifteen and change down to thirteen. No, uh, it ended up as 14.9%. So I'm not sure from a math perspective. So it was just under 15%. Right. And now you're down to what? 13, right? Are you talking about the percentage over the FAR? Or are you yeah. talking the percentage over the FAR is 14.96%? Yeah, that's what I have. Or I have 14.95. Right. So it's just under 15. So, um, Correct. Yes. So as a concept, I don't, I think that's fine. I'm just wondering whether, you know, we need to actually see the plans before we can approve this so that we can reference it. We can look at it specifically and then reference it into our resolutions. All right. If you give me a second, I should be able to pull those up for you. Um, I don't know, did we do a straw poll that we all feel that it needs to be reduced by that much? I know Greta felt it was very important for it to come under the 15% FAR. Um, so I'm very happy to look at the applicants revised plans, but I'm not sure that we we're all would feel the same that we wouldn't okay the original plans that he had. I, I don't think you had the votes, but go ahead, vote again. Um, I think Meg, it was you and me were okay with that. And then Robin was opposed, and then Doug. Robin, were you opposed on the grounds of the FAR being too large? That aspect? no, I think I, I don't have a problem with the FAR being too large. That to me is not the issue. I have a different problem with it, as I said. Right. But it's not because the FAR is too large. Because I do not agree. There's no. There's there are cases. I did a lot of research on this in the last few days. Well, last week actually, because I was curious about it. So I looked up. I researched every case, well, not every case, but a lot of cases, 59 cases showed up with the word area variance, percent, and substantial. And um, just the, and what my research showed is the, the problem with using that as a guide is that the only time you're going to get a determination, you know, it's usually an applicant who gets denied a variance who then challenges it. So we don't know what boards have granted, but Boards of the courts have said numbers from 10% to 100% is too big. Basically, all the courts do is basically what the courts do in every case is they uphold what the um, Board of Appeals has done, saying it was not irrational for the board to determine that X percent is substantial. 
So I don't think we, we as a board have never determined, have never held and have granted variances with um, that were much larger than 15%. So I don't think the cases require us to grant 15% and I don't believe we have to say 15% is substantial. Um, so, uh, so I don't think that's, to me, that's not the issue. My issue is just, this is too big as the non-conforming. I think we shouldn't allow it as a general, just as a general rule, but um, I have no problem. It's not a very, um, Robin. I mean, look, I look at it from the perspective of we have a lot of non-conforming houses in this village. Seriously. And I, I think we need to make sure that we're making the correct decision with respect to the application because it's going to have far-reaching impact on the other non-conforming houses in this village. Right. Right. Just so, leaving a simple question. So the, the question I think that Meg asked was, assuming we're a, it's going to be approved by the board, are there three votes to approve it with the original whatever percent that was application, or are there not three votes to approve it with the original applicant with the original floor area and um, the only way it's going to be approved is if the floor area is reduced to 14.96 percent as now proposed that's what I think Meg was asking and so uh, because we have to know because that's the issue I mean Greta said she wouldn't approve it without the I believe and if I'm misstating it Greta please correct me I believe Greta said she wouldn't approve it if it was more than 15 percent Meg and Abby have indicated they would um, so really, it's up to you to say, I'm sorry, I don't mean to put you in the spot, but that's with respect to what's going to be approved, assuming it's approved. And obviously, you're not committing yourself now because you could think about it and do whatever. Um, but I think that's what Meg was asking. And if you don't have an answer, Doug, that's okay, because we're not voting on it now. Um, no, I, I understand. You know, the, the dilemma I'm having is the nonconformities in the village, but yet I don't want to hurt this applicant. He's been here for a long time. He's looking to stay here. He's looking to keep his family here. And I understand that. Okay. You know, but I also look at it from a different perspective. I look at it from the impact that we could be facing with other nonconforming buildings in this village. You know, and I realize he, you know, the 90 square feet doesn't mean anything to me, okay? Because it's not on the first floor, it's on the second floor. That setback is always gonna be 8.5 feet. Am I correct, Mr. Taylor? That's correct. Right, you know, I mean, that's always gonna be that way. I think that, you know, the, 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 the I'm looking at it from a perspective of what about if we, the determination we make today is, or whenever we make this determination is gonna have a major impact on the other non-conforming buildings in this village. You know, I mean, 90 feet doesn't mean anything, seriously, because it's not gonna increase the side yard setback. It's not gonna make the building smaller. Okay, that footprint of that building is what that footprint of that building on that lot is. So to me, that 90 square feet is irrelevant. Doug, to your point about setting a precedent for non-conforming buildings is something to consider. But usually when we write a variance, we will write it pretty specifically. So it's not, it shouldn't impact all non-conforming buildings or make it simpler. Right. Um, yeah. we, write it, we write it to be applicable to this particular instance. And I mean, what I was argued you know, in the, I mean, I'm the not past, a, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm not going to have a major issue as long as we can specifically put in items in there that are unique strictly to this building. So I, I had listened to Robin's point that usually the code, we would assume that the code is written to make it um, that you need a variance to expand a non-conforming use because the intent is that eventually um, non-conforming uses um, are brought into conformance with, with the, the new zoning plan. And the well, argument, I'm sorry, the argument that I was making was that we are not 
the applicant is not asking us to extend, say, a really teeny studio apartment that almost doesn't work as a second home. This home, um, obviously, this building, the premises obviously work very well as two families, whether or not the extension to it is made or not. I don't yeah. see that if we denied this, that there's um, any likelihood that this is going to turn into a single family home anytime in the future. Um, so I didn't see how uh, by, um, yeah. if we denied this, that this is gonna bring this any closer. Um, but I understand, Doug, that you're concerned that we're setting a precedent for others, but if we could write something in there that um, th this is how we're viewing the property that we're not encouraging um, a use yeah. that would otherwise be reverting back to what is conforming in the in the zone. You know, um, ju just so you'll know, and, and Frank and Frank is there, uh, and he's listening, and and he can chime in anytime he feels like it. But the code, our village code, is very specific. You cannot increase a non-conforming building. Very clear. So. What we are doing is obviously the Board of Appeals has, has the right to grant a variance for a non-conforming use, okay? Uh, but what are the alternatives? And I'll tell you what the alternatives are and Frank is right there. If this application is denied, it would revert back to its original Wait a minute, hear me out, because I already know of cases in this village to where that has is and has occurred. It reverts back to comply with the zoning of the base. Frank? No, it's not, that's not, we don't need Frank. If all they're asking for is to expand their existing non-complying condition. So if right. we deny their right to expand, they continue to have a two-family, non-complying right. non two-family. They well, don't have I'm to revert to is, a one-family. Well, I agree. Oh. I agree. But if this board denies it, yeah. that brings on a whole other scenario. No, it doesn't. Frank? There's still a non-complying building. Hold on a minute. Frank, can you hear me? You want to unmute yourself yeah. or have William unmute you? Yes, I did. No, I unmuted okay. myself. We and also Frank had an instance as well as I do. Okay. There are non-conforming uses in this village, which they look to expand. They've been denied. Frank, what happens? But we've also had instances very recently where it didn't uh, revert back to a single family zone. Which one is that? Well, 130 Beach. You're having them, wait. I read what you said on 130 Beach, okay? And on 130 Beach, you are having them remove every item that would put it into a two family, a three family. Yeah, but it's not, it's not reverting back to a single family. It's no, still no, it's a, a grandfather to the original. two family. Okay, look, I have no problems. I, I'm serious. I have no problems with this application. I don't care about the 90 feet because the 90 feet does not impact how that house sits on the site. I, also I, am went, just went, concerned, I am just concerned that we can put the appropriate restrictions into this variance so that we do not lose control or set precedent that we're going to have to deal with in the future on other non-conformings. Everyone has to be unique. So we need to, if, there, if we're looking to go along with this, we need to ensure that we identified all the uniqueness of this application. Can I ask whoever's got that background noise that sounds like dishes and I'm not sure what else, if you could either mute your um, mic when you're not speaking or ask whoever it is in the background making the noise to stop, please. I don't know who it is. I don't, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm looking in my kitchen and all I see is tea being poured. <laughs> um, I mean, that's my position. 
I'll, I'll be honest, as long as we can put the appropriate uniqueness into a resolution, and I'm not going to worry about the 90 feet because it doesn't impact the, it doesn't impact the uh, footprint of the house on the lot. So Doug, so that I'm clear, you were talking about um, going back to the original plans, not the 14.9. Is that, am I no, I, I, yeah, yeah, what I'm saying is the 90 feet has no impact on this house sitting on the property. Okay, all right, thank you. It Mr. is Taylor, what it is. Yeah. Mr. Taylor, do you, do, you, do you have plans that show the night where, how it would look without the 90, without the uh, 90 feet? Yeah, hopefully I can uh, get permission to share and I do this appropriately, let's see. Will, can you give him whatever he needs so he can share those plans? Yeah, you got it? I didn't hear you. Go ahead. Okay. All right, all right. Okay. So this is the 90 square feet or less 90 square feet. Um, then you have the roof below. So this you know, signifies the difference. Uh, obviously the rooms here and here were smaller than the original. You guys probably have the original plans in front of you. Um, so I think all three of these rooms were reduced a little bit but we kept all of the bathroom and the stairs obviously. Uh, to the same size, but this is what the plans would look like. And then, let's see, let's see if I can share this. Can you see the rendering at this point? Yes. Okay. So that's that's the rendering and and what the actual uh, building would look like at that point. So we're looking at the setback right over in here. Correct? Uh, hold on, let me... Can you see my mouse? No. No, I can't see your mouse. Let me see. Okay, you see where your car is parked? Is that your car, I assume? Uh, well, it, it's, it's a fake car, but <laughs> sure. Okay. Facing there, I see that roof overhang, the little one, okay? Yep. yep. And the setback, and the setback for the upper section of the house. Correct. So that distance sitting right in there, okay? Yeah. Yep. All right. Yeah, and the distance between the original setback at um, 8.5 feet and the upper level, I think it's about four feet difference mm -hmm. um, in order to accommodate the 90 square feet change. I understand that. Now, let me ask you a question on the floor plan. Mm -hmm. What impact is that gonna have on, on your family's living? <laughs> so a 90, a 90 foot reduction. So um, the, the office that we have there is going to be very tight. Um, and the bedroom that was the larger of the two, obviously, is, is smaller as well. Um, the office itself is only 75 square feet now. So if you're talking about 90 square feet, it's, it's basically a room's difference. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't look significant, obviously, from the outside, but it's significant from the inside. And when you look you at... Can you put the floor plan back up, please? Yep, I will definitely do that. So you're looking at a bedroom, or your office is nine ten by eight foot. Uh, yeah, and your bedroom is is eight foot nine by twelve. And in the other way, it would have been, and I can't remember what it would have been. I don't have the plans in front of me. Uh, let me see if I have those to share. I have plans, but I don't see the dimensions on it. It's a 12 foot nine that way. From the out, from the, the, the wall that's being brought in would have been 12 foot nine inches from the up. The, the, uh, <laughs> All right, so it's 12 foot nine. It, it, it's 11 foot two in lieu of 12 foot nine. Is that what we're talking? No, the other way around. It's eight foot nine in. Right. I think it's eight foot nine in lieu of. Hold on, double checking. Yeah, it's right. eight foot nine inches in lieu of twelve foot nine inches. So it's a three foot uh, 
reduction yeah. in that. For, that for, yes, a four foot four reduction. Okay. Right. And that bedroom. Um, yeah. Is that one of your children's bedrooms? Yes, it would be. It would be my daughter's bedroom. And the office is for you or you and your wife or? Yeah, my wife, um, you know, we both work from home, especially with COVID and everything. So hey, we, we kind of share space as much as we can. Uh, but that you would be sharing that office? Um, yeah, pr primarily my wife, but sure. You know, Zoom meetings and all that kind of stuff. That's pretty much what we do at this point in time because you can't see people face to face. So um, all of our meetings, everything we do is from home at this point. So, yep. Okay. All right, thank you for putting that up. I appreciate it, Mr. Taylor. Okay, no problem. Anybody else want to see anything else? Okay. I don't know, Abby, what do you think? I mean, look, I think COVID has changed the name name of the game. I think mm -hmm. these are circumstances outside their control, right? They didn't create it. Um, I don't really think it changes the character of the neighborhood. So I'm I think it's the right thing to do for me, at least. With or without the 90 feet. I don't think the 90 feet makes a hell. That's what I said. I don't think it means a hill of beans. No. So well, I'm gonna I'm going to respectfully I'm gonna respectfully disagree um, with this reasoning that it is not permitted to expand a non-conforming structure. And if in my mind, if we're gonna do so, it has to be done in a way that's not material. You know, doing it in a material way is a direct contravention of the, the code. So um, I would support the alternate plan and I, I cannot support the, um, the original plan. So that's where I stand. Uh, before, I, I think the, this is all for, I think this is all of it. Do you, um, Mr. Taylor, is there anything else you wanna to add to this? To, the, to what you've said or to anything that's been said, and then we'll see if there's anybody else from the public who wishes to speak. Well, listen, I, I appreciate appreciate your time. You know, I think, um, you know, this is a, obviously a complicated issue. Um, for us, it's complicated as well. You know, um, you know, it's over the last couple of weeks, it's the the, the lack of a second bathroom <laughs> has come into, into play, uh, especially, um, you know, just trying to have, you know, four, four you know, big people, if you will, not all adults, but, you know, trying to get at the bathroom at the same time. And then you have, um, you know, a, a nine month old at this point as well that you're, that you're trying to kind of tend to. So um, getting that second bathroom obviously key, is key. And we're okay with the um, approval either way. Um, obviously we prefer the additional 90 feet. For us, it's basically a room um, as far as size is concerned. Um, obviously we can, we can reduce it, but Either way, we're just, um, you know, again, appreciative of the time spent, um, you know, talking about this and uh, obviously hopeful that uh, we'd get the approval. Uh, does anybody from the public wish to address this application? Is anyone from the public wish to raise their hand? Madam Chair, I don't see any wishing to speak. Sorry, I can't. What? I can't hear you, William. Yeah, Will, you're not, you're like, your your voice is very, not, it's not clear. You're like Darth Vader. Yeah, are you on the Starship Enterprise by any chance? William, I can't hear you. You're on mute? Yeah. I think, I think he said there's nobody from the public who wished to speak. Is that correct? Okay, we're going to use sign language, William. Okay. All right. Does anybody else on the board want to say anything or should we close this application and 
close the public hearing. I'll make a motion to close unless somebody has other questions or information that they're looking for. Nope, just want to second the motion to close. I'll second to close. Okay, uh, Doug. Yes. Meg. Yes. Abby. Yes. Greta. Yes. And I vote yes as well. So the public hearing is closed. Maybe we'll get to, hopefully we'll get to this tonight. I just can't guarantee. Right. Thank you for your efforts, Mr. Taylor. I appreciate it. Thank you for your time. I really appreciate that. Yes. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Have a good night. Night. Okay. Uh, let's go back to uh, the, what was on the agenda number one, case 2SP 2020-419 Mamaroneck Avenue Roaster Cafe. Is the applicant here on that now? Will, do you see the applicant? Hello, good evening. Somebody's on the phone. I think that is that the are you the applicant, sorry, for Roaster Cafe? Yes, yes, that's me. Uh, could you identify yourself, please? Yes, absolutely. Uh, I'm the one of the owners for the Roaster Cafe, 419 Marinic Avenue. My name is Mike Therese. So I, I'm going to recuse myself on this one because it's right around the corner. We had um, we had questions last time about violations that had been issued, and there's several of them. So if you could please discuss the violations which have not been closed, many of them. So yeah, this is my like this is my third third time actually being on this uh on this meeting about this about this uh violation so there were violations uh that was from that from last year which was taken care of and it was and the previous inspector came in and and did his violations but it was for some reason it was never cleared so we so after the second meeting i had asked from the village to come and uh signed uh, for the inspection and I believe uh, Dennis and uh, Charlotte came and looked at the place and uh, there was and it was all taken care of I mean it was taken with some of the were, there were a few that were taken care of from that last year which was supposed to be cleared already but there was one new one um, a violation that was a light was added on a tree which we took down there were, there that was were it. also a violation sidewalk cafe over size. Has that been reduced? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, Frank, do you know if there are any of the violations are still open? So the only thing I'm certain about at this point was uh, the, inside, the sign inspection failed due to a change in the design of the sign from what was approved. So his sign doesn't. Sign what sign application? There is for, for your Roasters Cafe sign. It didn't. Nothing was. True sign. Not, no, that, no, that was that. I don't recall that. Well, according to Charlotte, uh, when you were informed of this, you refused to correct it. Is this their outside okay. sign? Excuse Is this the sign on the outside of Roaster Cafe? Yes, that's what they're referring to. I mean, I, I, there's no, uh, there was, I mean, there, uh, I believe Dennis came and took pictures. There's nothing, no, what, what exactly uh, sign changes we're talking about. You were either supposed to correct the amending the sign or amending the permit, which you haven't done either one. I mean, if, Char if, Char if Charlotte's on the on the call, she can no, connect. She's not, but you know, I, I'm in constant contact, yes. with her and that's what she. she I was never. That was never brought to my attention. I'm not aware of that. The only thing I was 
The only thing was uh, the tree and uh, and the the what's it called? the office it had to be cleared out. I think those older violations were cleared out, but as far as I know, the sign is still an issue. Is um, Frank? Is there any way you can reach out to Charlotte tonight and now? I'm sorry, I'm just so we can get this. Ideally, we could finish De this it, up tonight. Is Dennis? Dennis on the on the let me, call let me by any chance? Charlotte and Charlotte will call in. I'm sure. Okay. No problem. I mean, if it does, if it's something that needs to be taken care of, we, yeah, that's what we're here for. But uh, I'm not. I this I'm not aware of this. So, so there may so we're waiting to hear. I guess I guess Frank is going to reach is reaching out to Charlotte now. We're trying or Dennis to find out the answer to that. Um, this, so that's an open question at this moment. I don't know what the answer to that is. Does anybody on the board have any other questions not relating to the sign, which we'll find out about? Do you have any other questions for the applicant here, for Mr. Madam Chair? Uh, Charlotte is here with me. Charlotte Mountain is here within in the office. Oh, so I'll let her speak. Thank you. How are you today? We can't hear her if she's speaking. <laughs> yes, hi, how are you? Hi, Charlotte, how are you? Could you just identify yourself for the record, please? I, I, sorry. Yes, ma'am, Charlotte Mountain, uh, Code Enforcement Officer, Village of Amarna. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so the quest of um, Frank raised this issue that said that there was a problem with the sign on Roaster Cafe that you had indicated it was too big or in some other way non-complying with the requirements, the approved sign or something. Can you just um, explain that, please? Yes, ma'am. Uh, when, when the application was made to the BAR, there was very specific text that was on that sign for, uh, that was approved by BAR. When the sign was installed, uh, the text differed. I explained to uh, Mr. Arici that the text, either, uh, that either he needed to have the text changed to match what was on the BAR application, or he should go back to the BAR and ask them to approve the sign the way that he had installed it. Neither has been done. And when did you let Mr. Arici know this problem? Was this something like done when he opened the, the restaurant, however many years yeah. ago that was? Yeah, yeah. And so that's been there for quite a, you know, for quite a while. Um, and, and can you tell us, have all the other violations been cleared up? Is that the only outstanding one for this property? Uh, then there was the fire in uh, 20, at the end of 2018, beginning of 2019. Uh, Ivan Quintero went out. He found uh, someone living uh, or uh, some bedding uh, inside of the restaurant. Uh, there was a sprinkler head that was damaged in the restaurant. Uh, there were a couple of other violations. Um, and because of the fire, there were also some electrical issues. He was he was given an order to remedy the violation um, that subsequently uh, went to court and is actually still in court because of the COVID shutdown. Um, the main issue that I can see that is still existing there is that he was told to get a licensed electrician to apply for a permit and do the corrections to the electrical system. We have no, we've never gotten an application for the electrical, so we don't know how that was handled, but uh, in the interim, it is still in court. I'd like to make a comment about what you just said. This is just total new right now. Everything what you just said is just, it's just been added on just now. I, I'm not, I don't understand where the electrician had to be uh, filed and get cleared. We, I, I don't understand where this is coming from. But at that time, after the fire, we, we went to the court. We actually went to the court and 
before we even opened, reopened, we had to get an inspection before opening. And Frank is aware of this. And everything was inspected. Everything was done. That's how we op reopened. And this is last year. I'm... There Frank, was no, there was no electrician. There was no electrician uh, involved in it. I mean, there was an electrician that had to come in and redo the work. Yeah, and then he he. That's, but that's, he probably yeah, didn't we, file for the permit. I think that's what the violation is. He never filed for the permit. So he did the work without getting a permit. I believe. No, no, that's not. A, that's not what happened. The, the violation was only, guys. The violation was only uh, up there. The the room. The, the it's not a bed. It's a, it was a chair that there was a room that had it was covered, so it had to be open for access. That was the only thing that was there. Yeah, that that was that was uh, restored to the way it was supposed to be. But as far yeah, so we're we talking about we talk now we're talking about something different, totally something different. Right now. We're just talking about the electrical permit that wasn't taken out and the sign, which is not what the BAR approved. That's what we're talking about. All right, the sign, yeah, I remember that we I remember that discussion. I spoke to uh, I mean, Betty Ann about like it's just a text, it was a, a website, it was our website, and then we just switched it to a be, uh, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. It was just uh, so we were just ch changing the text. So we, I guess, we got kind of skipped that part, out of which, which, which we were unsure if we needed, we really needed to go to a BA meeting. So that part I'm aware of, but the electric part was totally, totally new right now to me, totally. So I guess the real question is, he should have gotten a permit. There is no question. But if he did the work but didn't get a permit. But he did the work, and I don't know if he did, but assuming he did the work and just never got the appropriate permit, Frank, is there anything that needs to be done in the village to correct that at this point? Or is it just one of those things that he did it so you, you don't do anything about it? I, mean, I don't know if there's anything you can do. You know, getting a permit, he did work. He did work without a permit, not supposed to do that, not good, but work was done, assuming it was. Assuming the work was done, does he? Is there something else that needs to follow that? Yeah, he would have to get a certification from the fire underwriter that it was done correctly. I mean, these kind of things have to be like this. These kind of things have to be like you know discussed and like bring to people's attention. Like I don't understand. Every meeting we have a different things being added on. I guess that's because every meeting something new was brought to our attention that all should have been in the application or we should have all No, there was one meeting, there was one meeting that we answers. couldn't verify that there was one meeting that there was no that there was violations but you guys couldn't access it because there was an you didn't have the violations in front of you guys. So that it was postponed and the last one was uh, I mean again and again this is an established business. We've been here uh, for three years now. We have to do what we have to do, but like I don't know. It's just like new things being added on, but we, 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 does, does the we're, sign, I'm here to cooperate. Cooperate. I'll just get this thing done. Does the sign still say breakfast, lunch, and dinner on it? Yes. Because I, I do know generally you cannot put any advertising on a sign. So that's what happened that it wouldn't be fair to other owners, the business owners. They're not putting any advertising on their signs. It's just supposed to be your, your name. That's why the BAR looked at it one way and it makes a difference that you put that line in. I think the real answer has to be that if we do decide to approve it, it has to be, if we do decide to extend it at this point, it has to be with a condition that he go back to the BAR and cure that um, within a very limited time frame. And if he doesn't do it, then well, the- the um, I'll be, I'll, I'll be going, I'm sorry. I'll be going to be, I'll be going to the BAR, um, hopefully if everything goes right for the, for 308, so. I mean, I can get this, I can file a new application for BAR. I don't have a problem with that. That seems pretty reasonable to to do, Robin. You can just get him on his way, you know? And, and what about yeah. about the uh, applying for the electrical proving, you know, the license? 
I think we'd have to make that a condition also, that he has to get the certification that he needs from the fire underwriter that the electrical work was done correctly also. We'll have to put some time limit on it. No problem. I can do that too. Uh, Frank, that. what would be a reasonable time for him to get the certification that he needs? Two weeks, I don't know, 15 days. Oh, okay. I didn't know it was something that could be done quickly. That was what I was asking. Okay. Okay. Anybody on the board have any other questions for the applicant here? Um, Will, if you could thank Charlotte and ask her if she's got anything else to add. No, thank you. That's all. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, if nobody and nobody else has any questions for the applicant, is there anybody from the public who wishes to speak on this application? If there's anybody from the public, please raise your hand. Uh, Madam Chair, no one has indicated that they wish to speak. Okay. Um, do we want to close this application or does anybody need any additional information? I take I that just, as I have a question as to No, I have just have a question as to process. If we if we put in, you know, have a resolution and put in those conditions and then he doesn't follow through what what's the consequence the consequence would be that the special that the um, approval is revoked and as simple as that um and so he wouldn't have a special permit he'd have to close his restaurant because he wouldn't have a special permit that allows him to operate that's the consequence okay I mean, so we can give him a long time to comply. You know, we don't have to make it, depending on what the board wants to do, we can give him a long time to comply or whatever, but that would be the consequence of not complying with the conditions. Does anybody want to make a motion to close if nobody wants anything else? I'll make a motion to close. Well, let me just ask, does the applicant have anything else to add before we close? The public hearing yeah from this uh, i mean from this today's conversation i'm just gonna take care of these two things and then we should be good to go i mean i don't I hope hopefully there's no other other things been uh gonna be brought up okay um so then i think that's I, have, it. I'm sorry. I have one more question but i, I do want one question um, it's for the i have a question for the applicant and that is what time, you know, we know what um, the building inspector thinks is reasonable to cure these. Um, are you in agreement with him that, you know, you think you can cure these in, in a couple weeks or do you have a different time frame? The building inspector is only speaking about the um, light of the fire certification, not about the BAR. <laughs> but I, I, all right. The, the yeah, I mean, a couple of weeks, two to, two to three weeks should be fine. But I do want, like, you guys got to understand something. Like, with this, there was a fire, so we had to get. Uh, we had, we got, we got, we were shut down. So, in order to reopen, we had to follow guidelines and uh, go from uh, go by the procedures. Like we, we, we did everything the correct way. You know, having to get do this after a year, like it kind of, it doesn't really sound right. Like, I, I mean, that's what I, I just don't understand that part. Like we, you know, we, we had to get an inspection here to reopen before before anything we i mean why wasn't this broad like, the code has to be applied consistently so it has to be applied to you as well as it is to every everybody else in the village i mean i mean if that was the case then i i mean i had to get in a certification on the electric work in reordered open it was never brought you know it was never brought that then and now why is it being mentioned like that's what that's what i'm trying to I'm trying to make understanding i don't think we can answer that question as to why you were allowed to open if you were allowed to open without the certification um and if you had a certification that should be you just need to produce it for the building inspector 
to show him that you did have an, a, such a certification, but I don't, I can't answer why it's becoming to our attention now. And so from our perspective, that's why we're raising it now. Um, so you'll, you'll have to just- I mean, we did get inspection. There was what, there was an outlet. There was a, the fire happened uh, caused from an outlet. It was, the outlet was changed and it was, it was, I believe it was inspected. It, it, because that's where the, the, the main problem was occurred. So. I don't know the answer to your question as to why it's coming up now. All right. All right. Does anybody? Oh, does somebody want to make a, make a motion on the board to close? I'll make a motion to close. Close. I might move to close the public hearing on this application. I second. Okay. Uh, Meg. Yes. Abby. Yes. Doug. Recused. I don't know if he's there or not. I'm recused. Oh, right. Thank you. I forgot. Um, Greta. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So the public hearing is closed. We may get to discussion tonight. We may not. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. All right. The next uh, public hearing is calendar number three on the agenda, 805 Mamaroneck Avenue which is Chipotle Mexican Grill for a variance. Is the applicant here? The applicant seems to be on mute. I don't know if- Yes, I, I just unmuted and I'm going to start my video. If, okay. So uh, good evening, honorable chair, members of the board. My name is Jordan Fry. I'm a partner with the law firm of Snyder and Snyder in Tarrytown. Um, also with me tonight, I don't, I do not see that they have authorization yet. But uh, Angela Poshia of my firm, uh, associate, is here as well as um, Jorge uh, Arada of uh, CAD Signs. Um, we're here tonight on behalf of uh, CAD Signs, the sign contractor, as well as. Chipotle, uh, the restaurant at 805 Maranac Avenue. Um, so um, what I'd like to do actually now is share my screen because I think that's the best way for the this honorable board to um, understand the property as well as uh, the proposed signage and what is existing. So I'm going to share my screen. Okay. This is a little larger here. Can everyone see the screen? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, 805 Maranac Avenue was originally a. Um, it contained uh, two buildings. It was a A and P supermarket, as well as a uh, two uh, multifamily uh, residential building. So, can everyone see my cursor? Mm -hmm. So this is where the. Uh, the multi-family uh, residential building is located. This is the um, north side of the property. Mamaroneck Avenue is over here. And this is the, um, this is where A&P was. And there's a North Shore Farms, which is a supermarket and as well as a CVS. So you can see the existing, and then there's a large um, parking parking lot. And then just this photo here is from um, the, the, uh, the shopping strip where the residential building was looking out towards the parking lot. You can see there's existing mature vegetation. And one of the photos I'll show you, the neighboring property is a uh, Speedway gas station. This you can kind of see from within the parking lot on, on, on the uh, south side of the property. And then finally, this is uh, looking north from a Maranek Avenue in the sidewalk. Um, you can see the existing mature vegetation and, and the Chipotle store is actually um, screened, um, but it, it, it's, the, it's the anchor tenant on the shopping center. So here's the, um, the existing uh, conditions of Chipotle. So Chipotle on the west facade, which, which is on Maranek Avenue, 
has an existing sign. The existing sign is um, in compliance with the applicable uh, code requirements, which we'll go over. Uh, it's two and a half feet tall or 30 inches by uh, 12 feet and about 10 and 3 16 inches long. This is the front of the, this is the front of the, the store. However, it's not the main entrance. It's a side, it's, it's really the, the accessory entrance. And, you know, folks walking on the sidewalk can approach, can approach uh, the store from, from this location. However, the um, south facade of the building is where the, the main entrance to the Chipotle is. And it's a longer facade. Um, the facade, well, actually, I'll, I'll get into the, 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 the length of the facades on my next few slides. But I, what, what I wanted to bring to this honorable board's attention is, I, I'm sure you recall, but in February, um, this honorable board did approve the special permit for the Chipotle restaurant. Um, this resolution was actually pulled today off of uh, the village's website. Um, and now as part of the special permit plans, there was signage that was shown, which is very similar to this proposed signage, except for we'll, we'll, we'll get into it, but the design is actually a little neater and, and the most up to date, but you could see that on the uh, west facade where the existing sign is and, and, and a sign permit was obviously uh, granted and, and sign installed, had the Chipotle existing sign on the plans. And this is the main entrance, which also had the same Chipotle sign. And the proposal uh, is gonna be such that both the sign in the front of the building on uh, the Maranek Avenue and the accessory sign, which is really the main sign is going to be the same size. Here's some just uh, more existing photos. This is the front of the building. This is the little entrance from the sidewalk, but it's not the main entrance. This again is the uh, existing conditions. This photo was taken yesterday um, and Chipotle actually opened on October 30th, just last week. As you can see, there's very minimal is a temporary sign and it's very hard to identify. Um, I'm pleased to report that the Chipotle um, is doing well. I spoke with the store manager. Um, actually, um, while this doesn't really have to do anything with the sign, I thought the board would, would like to know that uh, in these COVID times, Chipotle is, is, is serving your, your, um, your village well. Um, Chipotle has a um, technology where, where actually customers are able to order their, their uh, meals on an app and then easily walk in the restaurant and, and walk out. And um, they've had very nice success. But in the meantime, they've also been able to, to um, use some nice social distancing measures just so this board knows that their special permanent it's really being used to serve the community very well. I also had a photo taken last night of the Chipotle. You could see again, the main entrance has no sign um, and that's why we are here tonight. Um, now, this is the existing facade and the existing facade has a distance of 44 feet. That's important because we'll get into the zoning code requirements, but the a sign is permitted to have a length of 75% of the existing facade. It's also, but it cannot exceed 50 feet. So set the, 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 it's the lesser of 75% of the existing facade or 50 feet. So Chipotle only installed a sign that's two and a half by approximately let's call it 13 feet wide. Therefore, instead of using the entire 75% that they were entitled to, they only used, um, 13 feet, which is, which is much less. They, they could have had approximately a 33 foot long sign. And this is important because it's going to impact the proposed sign um, as I'll get into. Now the existing facade on, on the west uh, entrance and the main entrance that's going into the property is 56 square, uh, excuse me, 56 feet long. But again, the proposed sign is gonna be the same size sign um, as on the front of the building. So uh, just architecturally, it would make sense to have at least the same size sign or uh, potentially even a greater size sign, but Chipotle is not proposing that. Now section 286-10A of your, your zoning code, that's what sets forth that your sign can be 30 inches tall, which is what Chipotle sign is on the existing uh, 
front of the building and uh, the, the lesser of 75% or 50 feet in length. So again, Chipotle could have installed a sign that was approximately 33 feet long, or in other words, 82 square feet. Now this is where, where the variance comes in. An accessory sign that is for an entrance that faces a parking lot can only be 50% uh, or less of the uh, proposed sign. So had Chipotle installed an 82 square foot sign, which they would have been uh, allowed to do by right, they actually could have installed a 41 square foot sign, which you'll see some of the other um, signs on the on the their neighbors it looks like appear to be that that size. Um, but by way of not being aggressive with the front uh, sign or the, the front yard sign, um, it actually uh, hurt them uh, by way of requiring this variance over the main entrance. Technically, if Chipotle removed the existing sign, installed an 82 square foot sign, and then went for a 41 square foot sign over the main entrance, they technically wouldn't need a variance. So let's talk about the architectural design of this uh, building and the signage. So this is the front, and this sign is, was, was, is Chipotle's um, latest and greatest signage. It's existing. This is the one that's on the front. And you can see that what Chipotle did is it's only one color. It's all white. However, the sign is open and it actually uses the, act, the, the backdrop or the color of the facade and incorporates the color of the facade into the sign. Um, to, to what we believe is a very nice and, and tasteful uh, presentation. And here's a photo simulation. Um, which was done while they were still under construction. But, but you can see this is the existing sign. This is the proposed sign. The existing facade on the uh, west, uh, excuse me, on the, yes, the west side, which is on the Maranek Avenue, is approximately 44, 44 feet long. Now, the facade on the facing the parking lot is again 55 feet long, approximately 56. So uh, again, Chipotle is only proposing signage that is the same size, but it's on a larger facade. Now here is a uh, photo simulation of the proposed sign from the parking lot. As you can see, the sign is visible from, um, from the Southern portion of the parking lot, which is necessary. You can also see that Orange uh, Fitness has a nice long sign. They have a smaller uh, entranceway than Chipotle. You could see the number of windows that Chipotle has versus Orange Fitness, as well as the nail salon, much smaller signage. And again, this is 32 square uh, feet that Chipotle is proposing. Now, if it was to follow the code, it would only be a, a sign of 16 square feet on a uh, 56 uh, foot long facade. And that's what the simulation shows. You can hardly read the sign. And this is just an up close picture of orange uh, mm -hmm. fitness sign, which again is much longer. And I suppose they met the 75% uh, uh, distance, um, but again, Chipotle is not coming nearly close to that. I just want to remind this board also that this is a two, approximately two, over two acre property. Um, so again, you know, you need to take into consideration that the signage needs to be, you know, visible from uh, the middle of the parking lot. And then again, we're just showing the similar signs with the, the existing conditions. And so if we talk about the size of the variance, it's, it's, it's a very small variance uh, in that technically only approximately 16 is allowed because the existing sign is approximately 33 square feet on the front of the building. So we're talking about a 16 square foot variance, which again, if Chipotle wanted to get around, they could install a bigger sign on the front of the building and, a, and that would allow a, a, a sign of this size or even greater on the main entrance. Regarding the uh, surrounding area, uh, we did uh, 
investigate the surrounding area a little bit just to see if there's been any other precedent set in the, in the village. Um, and you can see this all state sign. This is the front of 600 Mamaroneck and it's side sign. Obviously it's a different building. Um, I would argue that uh, the variance for Chipotle is much more important because this is on a street corner, but they're still, they're still required to be 50% of the, um, the main sign. Whereas Chipotle's main entrance is in an over two acre property that's heavily um, screened and uh, is much larger and very important. Let's just go back. We're, we're talking about a new Chipotle store that needs to tell their customers we are here and they did it in a tasteful fashion and that they didn't exceed, they didn't make this an 82 square foot sign. And now they're, they're bound by this in their, their main entrance as well, which uh, is tastefully uh, designed. Again, enterprise, very similar situation as the all, all state. Um, and then, uh, you know, I'm happy to answer any questions if the board has any questions before we just go into a quick review of the five factors. Why don't you finish presenting and then the board will ask any questions. Sure. Um, I'm just going to ask my associate, Angela uh, Kasha, was there anything, Angela, that you would like to add that maybe we, we uh, didn't mention? No, I think you've covered everything so far. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So I'll just put the proposal. So um, I'm happy to answer any questions and obviously the board needs to open this up to the public as well. Uh, Does anybody have questions for the applicant? Yes. Your sign is bordered, okay? And even though it's smaller, pull out the view that shows all the storefront signs inside the parking lot, please. Okay. You see your sign? Yes. It's very gaudy and big in relationship to the other signs that are sitting there because it's bordered. So you see, really? well, hold on. You see pink on nails? Just letters. You see, you know, the issue I have with your sign, one, it's twice as big as permitted as an accessory sign, which is supposed to be 19 and a half square feet. Regardless of that, okay, while your sign may be smaller it sticks out far gaudier. And if you look from the street to see that sign, pull your view out from Marinick Avenue, please, to where you showed that face was obstructed. Okay. You see that? You can't see that sign no matter what. Right, so the, so- Wait, so, let me finish. Sure. Sure. But you do have a storefront sign sitting right out in front there that's going to say Chipotle in it, isn't it? That advertising sign of what's inside that shopping center? I'm ready to respond once you, you give me the go. No, I want you to answer it. Sure, sure. So, on there? so the, purpose, the purpose of the sign is not for the... Uh, it's, it's to advertise within the shopping center just like all of the other... Um, the, all the other I, I have no doubt, and I understand that. But if you look at it in relationship to the other signs that are on the face of the other stores, even though your sign may be smaller, keep taking it back, it is still very large in relationship to the lettering on the other stores. So the question I have is, if you want white lettering on there, why don't you make it look similar to pink O'Neill's to where it just says Chipotle on it, rather than the border and the logo on the side, since you have that on the main side on Marinick Avenue. So no, it's just, oh, sorry, I don't mean to interrupt, but please. I think that's a brand. So I don't know how much flexibility they would actually have with that. So, sorry. Sure. No, I, I, Abby, I, I understand but look at it in relationship to all the other signs inside there. So, um, and it, that sign stands out a mile above all the others against that shopping center section. 
But so, you have to imagine why it does. And the reason why it does is because of that border and that logo. It also stands it, out actually for another reason, Doug. If you could go back to all the stores, please. The other stores are all on a gray background. Therefore, the sign doesn't stand out as much. The Chipotle is a red background, which makes the sign stand out more. Um, I understand. That's why I'm saying. Regardless of whether or not they, even if they didn't have that border, it would stand out because it's white on red as opposed and, to white on gray. And the other suggestion, uh, the other suggestion I have is you take that sign from that middle and drop it down into the alignment of all the other signs that are there with just letters, Chipotle. It will not, and I understand what you're saying, Robin, but it won't stick out as much as that sign does. But you see, it's a taller building. I don't know how good right. that would look. Even sure. if it's lower and it matches the height, I'm not sure that would look better. So if I could just address the board. So I, I, I want to I address the board on a couple of issues. First off, this is the existing sign. This sign, this sign is uh, in between. You can see there's architectural lines. This sign is within those architectural lines. This is permitted as of right. I okay. see and, at, and and this sign could actually be increased from 32 square feet to 82 square feet. You divide 82 by 50% or multiply it by 50%. I can, we can put a 41 square foot sign here and not be in front of this honorable board. However, um, Chipotle did not do that. Um, now the simulation, I do think this simulation is, is a little, it's not the, the most perfect simulation and the gentleman from CAD signs can, can explain this, but this, this white border this white border is not going to um, be over these lines. Um, we did this simulation and I totally understand the request uh, at the request of the village staff. We did this simulation, but it's not an easy simulation. The, the sign is gonna be within these lines, just like this existing, existing um, sign. Also the letters of the Chipotle sign are, are, are actually smaller, I believe than, than the other signage and um, the height of the building, the height of the building requires the sign to be higher. No, it would it look very awkward if, if it wasn't to scale with the height of the building. Now, again, this signage was shown um, to this honorable board with these drawings, which were approved as part of the special permit application. The applicant did, on, the only change is, is that the applicant use the sign that is actually less intrusive in our opinion, because it's got an open back. Um, and again, you can see this existing, um, this existing shot. The sign is not that uh, intrusive to the area. It's clean, it's clear. There's no, you know, it's not like it's got multiple colors. And again, it needs to be advertised in this uh, shopping, uh, center. Uh, uh, and again, just following the letter of the law, we could have increased the size of the sign on the front of the building and not even gone in front of this honorable board, but Chipotle followed the architect's design from the special permit application. Anybody else, any other members want to ask the applicant any questions? Um, I do have a point to raise. It's, it's as much to ask the board as the applicant. I actually find the sign to be tasteful and I appreciate that they did something that made sense and looks great inside the shopping center next to the size of the other signs. I also think when you do look at that rendering, you put a bright white sign that's very clear because you're overlaying it and it's not the photograph and like the white the other signs are duller because it's an actual photograph and you put it on clear. So I don't have a problem. I think you really thought out the proportions of the sign over the door. My question is when I'm looking at when two signs are allowed, because um, it's only in special occasions, special situations that you get two signs. In general, the village is looking for one facade sign per building. Mm -hmm. And I understand um, what I need to know is what is the front of the building? Because the facade sign is usually on the front of the building and, and a property owner or business owner is allowed a, an accessory sign when it's on a side or rear of a building. Mm -hmm. And I know you're calling the building the side that 
the wall of the building that's facing the Maranek Avenue you're calling is the front. I know it's the front of the lot line, but does that necessarily make the building that's the front of the building? Because when I look at the sign code, when I look at the code here in 286-12, it's um, I think number three there, when it tells that you're allowed to have an accessory sign, it talks about the front and the rear and the side of the building. It's not talking about the front and the side and the rear of the lot. So are we all in agreement that the wall of the building that is facing Mamaroneck Avenue is actually the front of the building? It's one continuous building. All the front doors to all the buildings are along the side that goes into the parking lot. Mm -hmm. I think most people would consider that the front of the building. And then the side, the, the, the wall of the building that's facing the Maranac Avenue would then be a side of the building. I know that it's, that's the front lot line. Does that automatically make that the front of the building or should we consider that a side? Sure. So I, I think that it should only be very special situations that you get two signs. I, th I think that's the way the code, the intent of the code is that mostly we have one facade sign. Mm -hmm. I think that is very appropriate and the size is appropriate as you've shown us over the front door. What I'm questioning is the additional sign facing Mamaroneck Avenue. Um, and so, I, I think, I actually don't think, I think the front of the building is always, just like the front yard is always the front on the street. I don't think there can be any question that the front of a building is the portion of the building facing the street. That is the front of the building. It's not the front right. of the business. It's not the front of the store, it's the front of the building. And the front of the building um, for this is the front, is the portion on the Marinic. I understand that's where you feel. I okay. was raising a good well, I wonder if other board members feel the same. All of the front doors, I, 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 there's I, I, no I, entrance really to it on that side there. I'm, I'm gonna disagree with Robin because if that is the front of the building on Marinic Avenue, then the signs that are sitting on all the other shops sitting in there are really side building signs so so they are wait so they are not main entrance the, listen the parking lot was put in and the main entrances to those facilities are off the parking lot that is the main entrance regardless so front means nothing that is a side beat only because it's on Mamaroneck Avenue. Go to Pink, go to the nail place on the other end. That's on the corner. Okay. So, so is I, the main entrance on the side of it? Or is right, it Doug main, makes a point. Why would the other But building? the problem is that if these were side, however, if you look at them as front entrances, you can't have this many signs. You're only allowed one sign per front of a building, which would mean there could only be a sign on whatever the one front is, one sign per front. That's not how this is interpreted. And from a reasonability standard, it doesn't make sense to say that this entire shopping center or the strip here is one building. Otherwise you would say yeah. in front of the building was facing the parking lot and front of the building is the front then you've got two buildings here. You've got the building with the North Shore Farms and CVS, and you've got the building with the other stores. That's two buildings. Each building would be entitled to one sign, and that makes no sense in this context. So I Robin, think the question Robin, is, let me finish, Doug. Let me finish, Doug. If in this context, you can't look at it like that. You have to look at each store separately in order to have this make sense. I concur and, and also and I, I will look at that and I will look at that and I will take you to the corner of is it North Barry Avenue in the Boston Post Road and that shopping center that sits behind it every one of those stores in that shopping center has its own unique sign now if you're saying frontage and the Boston Post Road is the frontage of that building they couldn't have those signs there would be one sign across the Boston Post Road going into the front, and that isn't, wait a minute, that is not the case. The stores in there have individual signage, and that includes the restaurant on the corner. So You're, mix, no you're mixing up apples and oranges, this because it's, the, that, that building isn't saying either, if you say that the main entrance to a shopping center 
is the entrance on the parking lot. This, the, our code doesn't regulate by the, um, by the store, it regulates by building. So if a, what yeah. is a building here? Is a building a store? It has this, to be. Can, can, we, I, can I speak? We allowed the building, they would give this, this application, 805 Mamaronic Avenue was granted a development to create, while in one building, different business operations. Correct. That put them individual. They each had to come before our board. Every one of them had to come before our board. Every one of them had to go to the BAR for a sign to put over their entrance. The, what you're explaining is they're not gonna have any signs or the signs over those buildings are gonna be 19 and a half square feet, according to the code. The issue comes out. No, and I'm, Robin, you and I will disagree on this from now until whenever, okay? But that the front of that building is you enter that parking lot, that is the front of that building. North Shore, North Shore and CVS, all right, they're way set way back off Mamaronic Avenue. And you're saying that's the front. You're saying Chipotle on Mamaronic Avenue, that's the front. They're, so I disagree. I, I'd appreciate if I had a moment to, to speak. So uh, the building inspector who I, I know is uh, here, his interpretation is the same as the applicant's interpretation. Um, he, he, he has a notice of disapproval that requires us to get a, um, a, a, a variance for an accessory sign, okay? Mm -hmm. Your code, the spirit of your code is to address, is to address buildings that have a front building on a main road, but also have an entrance to a parking area. Uh, it even says one accessory sign may be permitted on the side or rear of a building, provided the rear side of the building faces a public or private off-street parking area. That's exactly what this parking lot is. That's exactly what it is. And it should be in similar appearance uh, as, as the other sign. And we are get which is the exact appearance of the other sign. And it shall be 50% or less of the other sign. So yes, we are, we are requesting a variance for 50% of less. But in this instance, it's a variance we're talking about for 16 square feet because the, the agenda has the signage larger than it is because it was the, the calculations were rounded up by the village um, staff. But it is instead of uh, what's permitted is 16 square feet. We're talking about 32 square feet. And again, you know, these this signage was in front of this honorable board. Um, it's the same signage, but just a nicer design. Um, I've been to this Chipotle actually yesterday. It's a very, very nice sign. It's not um, intrusive at all. It's one color. It's consistent with other signage in, on um, Maranac Avenue. This orange fitness sign is much, much longer and much more intrusive in my opinion, but it was permitted as of right, um, which we can get a sign that size permitted as of right if we change the, the size of the sign, which we're not looking to do. There's no impact to the surrounding area. The, this is the, an existing gas station that has existing mature vegetation. Okay, look at all this vegetation here. There's no, we're, we're talking about the inside. North Shore Farm sign is much, much larger. There's no impact to Mamaronac Avenue because of this existing, uh, uh, street foliage. Now, yes, we do have a sign on the front of this building, which again, the building inspector determined was the front of the building and we concur because folks do walk. This is a pedestrian uh, sidewalk here. There's a school across the street. Um, there's an Avalon uh, residential building. Of course we need to, we're operating a business here in COVID times. We need the signage. We didn't go above and beyond. We didn't go to 82 square feet. We need to, we need to advertise our store. We are the anchor tenant. And the sign is, is properly placed in this area. It's between the lines. And this is the taller storefront. Um, and, and I will show you, I'm gonna share my screen, but I need to stop it for a second. And I'm gonna share a different, um, I'm gonna share your agenda from, um, from your February meeting, okay? And just give me a moment here if I can 
share my screen again. Let's see here. Okay, this is from your February. Um, I don't know if that worked. Can you see this screen? Yes. Okay. All right, this is from your February agenda. All right. This is, this is how this, this was presented to the board. There's no different. It's the same, it's the same. And there's two signs. I'm sorry, but there's a little technical difficulty here. There's two signs. And we kept the white. We kept the white letters. We have, we have a, an orange fitness that is very bright and intrusive. Chipotle is not doing that. Um, but we need to advertise on the front. We, we got to advertise inside the shopping center. We're running a business here. We're serving the community. We can technically remove the existing sign and make a much larger sign. That's not what Chipotle is looking to do. That's not what, what, what is happening at all. Um, so so uh, uh, Doug, and, Doug and, and Meg, with respect to your quest, your comment about front of the sign, I just want to read. What the code says is business establishment shall be limited to one facade sign. It doesn't say the front. It doesn't say anything else. It says one facade sign, which arguably right. could be on any facade because right. the facade is a facade. Um, okay. Then it says one accessory per sign may be permitted. That there it says on the side or rear of a building, provided that the rear or side of the building faces a public or private off street parking area. Therefore, right. the code indicates the, or implies that the, the, the accessory sign is something facing a private off-street parking area. If you interpreted um, the off-street parking area sign as being the, the non-accessory sign, they could not have one facing Mamaroneck Avenue. And that doesn't really make any sense to me. So that, that was, that's what I'm questioning. So whether or not, I have no problem with the sign that they have planned for over the door, I understand they need it. Looks great to me. Makes a whole lot of sense. It's whether or not they have the right to have the one on uh, facing okay. Mamaroneck Avenue. That's why I raised that one um, because the way I'm reading it, it talks about the buildings themselves. That the building. Mm -hmm. So I guess all of the others put their facade sign on the side of the building because it doesn't say where they could have it or not have it. Just as a facade sign, it doesn't mm -hmm. say in the front. It doesn't say anything else. Just as a facade sign. Well, I am not a fan of adding two signs, never have been. And, and I don't want to create Central Park Avenue and Yonkers in Mamaroneck. That's my position, flat out. Well, I, I, I don't believe that this is Central Park in, in um, uh, Central Avenue. This is a signage that, um, again, is permitted as of right if we want to increase the size. Chipotle did not increase the size. They kept it uh, in compliance with the special permit signs. If here. you put up a sign that's 39 square feet, the code says it has to be 50%. That would mean 19 and a half. Right. But if we take the sign off of the front of the building and put a sign that's 82 square feet as permitted, we can then put a sign that's 41 square feet over the side. And we wouldn't be sitting here right now. We would be, we would be- uh, I think we all understand fire. that and we appreciate that and that it's not oversized. And I don't think anybody is arguing with you that, that the size that you're, you're attempting, I don't know, Doug might have a little problem with whether it's gaudy or not, but I think the majority of us are fine with the size and, and how you've designed the sign. So I don't think we need to keep All right, I appreciate on that. that. And, and it's whether or not some of us were just looking at the code and wondering how to interpret the code in its meaning about the two different signs. Understood. And, and I completely agree with uh, Madam Chair as well as the building inspector's interpretation. Thank you, Mr. Fry. Does anybody from the public wish, wish to speak on this application? Will, anybody there? Yeah, one person. Okay, could you identify yourself and speak? Mr. Radman, please uh, unmute yourself. Can you hear me? Yes. 
started the video. I don't know if it's coming up or not, or, or I have to be allowed in. We do have no, a we video see you and we hear you. You're oh, there. okay, sorry. I wasn't aware that you could see me. Um, thank you for hearing the application. Um, our, our representative, um, I'm uh, sorry, basically me. Who are you? <laughs> you just identified Dan your name, Mr. Radman. Who are you with respect to this application? I'm Dan Radman. I'm the design manager for Chipotle for this particular location. I'm surprised you guys have seen me at least four other times. You'd remember me. Yes, but you need to identify yourself for the record. I know. I know. I'm just joking. Understood. Um, thank you for hearing us on this application. I think we've we've made all the points here that we possibly could in terms of trying to address the architectural appropriateness and scale of this sign for the side elevation. Um, we have been doing everything we could by the book and by the code as directed by the building inspector and with their guidance in terms of the application. We intentionally kept the size of the scale, uh, size and scale of the sign facing the Maranek Avenue smaller. We did not want a large gaudy sign on either elevation. Um, and we wanted it to be in a appropriate scale in relationship to the facade of the building. Similarly, for this side sign, um, our, our representative made all the points that I'll just quickly reiterate. Um, we're trying to, number one, keep the branding and uh, logo image uh, the, of the sign, design of the sign, the same as the front. Um, it is uh, equal in size to the front sign, but as pointed out, um, it would be if we were to maximize our front signage, this one would actually be below that 50% rule. Um, I disagree with um, one of your board members that it's gaudy. I don't think it is. Um, it's actually quite elegant. It's a uniform color fabrication um, channel letter sign that's halo lit. I'm sure you guys have seen the existing sign at night and it's a very elegant presentation of the sign. And we would do the same exact sign on the side elevation. And they are, and, and the proposed sign is in scale and in keeping with the relation, the size of the other signs on, uh, in the complex. Um, yes, we have a box around it, but that is part of our brand. That is part of our logo. Um, and we'd like to maintain that. We were allowed to do that for the front. And I think we should be allowed to do that for the side elevation. Um, that's all I've got. I appreciate your time again. And uh, look for your positive um, approval on this. Uh, is there anybody else from the public who wishes to address the board? If there is, please raise your hand. Uh, Madam Chair, no one else is indicating that they wish to speak. Um, okay, does anybody on the board have any additional questions, I guess, for the applicant? I guess we have two representatives from the applicant. So does anybody have a, a question for either? Um, member of the applicant team. Um, okay, uh, do we want to, does anybody else need anything or do we want to close the application? I'll motion to close if everyone's agreed. Um, I'll second. Uh, I, 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 uh, okay, yes, sorry. Um, Ms. Sorry, Meg. Yes. Greta. Yes. Abby. Yes. Doug. Yes. And I vote yes as well. The uh, applicant public hearing is closed. We may or may not discuss this tonight. So, thank you for thank your time. You. Thank you very much for your time. Um, all right. Can we? I, I need to take a five-minute break, quick break. So can we take a five minute break before we begin the, um, the next application, the next public hearing? Or do you wanna continue and you could, could start without me? Um, yep. Okay, so let's take a break. A five no, minute break. break. Okay, let's take a five minute break.
is uh, Meg, um, are you back? So we can begin, Abby, are you there? I don't know who Doug. Uh, yeah, I'm here. Okay, hey, yeah. Robin, yeah. I, maybe I missed it, but why, are, aren't we going into executive session at some point? I'm a little- Yes, confused. but not until after the public hearings are done. <sighs> okay. Um, we'll finish all the public hearings, then we'll go into executive session. Okay, got okay. it. Just Is so that that a separate, that's a separate Zoom meeting, correct? Right, yes. Okay. Um, okay, I guess we, we so we're all back. Let us uh, reopen the public hearing or continue the public hearing. I'm not sure Greta's back. Is Greta? Oh, there's Greta. Sorry. Yeah, Greta's there. Thank um, you. So this is item number four on the agenda, case number 15A, 2018, 416 Waverly Avenue. This is a, a determinant, is a, that we, what we are considering tonight is the completeness of the revised draft environmental impact statement. Before we begin, um, I know Michael, um, we had asked you, a, I'd asked you a question last time, which was what is the, uh, what about the fact that what if we do not determine completeness within 30 days of submittal? So you were going to look into that if you please let us know. Good evening, Chair. Uh, I did get a chance to look into it. Um, <clears throat> basically, as, as we suspected previously, the statute is without an enforcement mechanism for the 30 day time period. Um, I believe it's, it's, it's a time period that's laid out without any teeth. Um, I don't think anything will happen if we go over it. Furthermore, in the, uh, the seeker handbook, I did find some language uh, with regard to the time frame for determining completeness and adequacy in it. It stated that an agency may negotiate with a project sponsor to establish a longer review period. <laughs> if the, uh, the draft EIS is complex or extensive. So it would seem to me from, from some of that instruction that um, it's fine if we go over that 30-day that period, but I would think we should try to, uh, to agree to a, a, a set period with the project sponsor and get that onto the record. Okay, thank you. Um, Okay, so we have to, we have a work session on November sixteenth, so I think we're going to consider it then. I, I suppose what will happen then is we'll figure it out, or if some of the board members have anything else. Um, next question: I have a question for the applicant. As I recall, at the so this is just applicant. We just have a simple question now. Not if you're there, I should ask: Are you there? Yes, okay. Um, so my question for the applicant is as follows. At the last meeting, we talked about uh, getting black lined copies um, and there were appendices. And my question is, did you submit a black line of the entire, of the entire DEIS? And did you submit a, the appendices in hard copy or just electronically? Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board. Good to see you. It's been a long time since we've been before you. Glad to see that you're all safe and well. For the record, my name is Tony Joffrey. I'm a member of the law firm Cuddy and Fader, 445 Hamilton Avenue, White Plains, New York. Uh, we did, uh, after your last work session, and we had the opportunity to speak to Ms. Lai, who I see is here this evening, as well as Mr. Long, we did make a, a supplemental submission on October 28th that provided the red line that you did request as well as electronic copies and additional appendices uh, that were requested as an outgrowth of your last work session. Was the red line, because was the red line of the entire um, DEIS or, and was it in hard copy or just electronically? Both. Um, so we didn't get that yet, um, William. So somewhere you presumably you have the hard copies of the, of the black line. And do you, and, but um, Mr. Joffrey, you only submitted the appendices electronically, not in hard copy? Well, what we did is we submitted the, um, I'd, I'd like to clarify, we were requested to provide three hard copies. So that's what we provided. If you need additional copies, we'd be happy to provide those. And the appendices didn't change. There was just one uh, change out and we did provide the hard copies of the appendices uh, that, that changed out. 
Okay, so I think, so when you said, you just said you provided three hard copies, three hard copies of what? So I'm just gonna go through my October 28th letter, identifies that we provided six flash drives with the complete revised DIS with the appendix, three hard copies of revised chapter 4H, which is traffic and transportation, three hard copies of the revised traffic and parking study, um, which is in the, in the appendix, and three copies of the red line DIS. Three hard copies of the red line DEIS? Okay. Um, bo um, board members, how many of you, raise your hand, would like a, a, a hard copy of the uh, black line? I would. Anyone else want a hard copy of the black line? Greta would. So just Greta and I want the hard copies. Okay, so then three copies should be adequate. And you provided a flash drive. Uh, you provided at sufficient flash drives for, for, you said six flash drives? Six flash drives. Okay, so William, you're going to need to get that to us all, please. Wait, I thought Absolutely. he did. Madam Chair, staff will get that to you tomorrow. Okay. I thought, I thought he did. Yeah, I already no, have a flash was, drive. Yeah, I got a flash I, I, drive. I have, I have a flash drive. Yeah. You got a flash drive originally of the uh, revised draft EIS. However, right. it didn't include the appendices and it didn't include the black line. Okay. And that's what the second flash drive um, or hard drive for Greta and me. I would like a hard copy of the red line. Right, so that's what I said. So, um, so uh, Mr. Jaffe, if you would please so provide one more hard copy or at least, or how many more hard copies do you think why, we need? Why, why don't you make it six hard copies? For all so of us. three more hard copies. Right. Five I hard would like a. I'm sorry, us. Robin. I I just want a hard copy of the red line. Right. I understand that's all he's doing. Thank you. Right. I wasn't sure what you were referring to. Right. Right. So just so the board members are aware, the, the red line copy um, is only of the text changes. So it's it's just going. To, and there were a couple chapters that didn't have any changes. So that's all. It's going to be a short packet. Okay. I, I understand. No, that. I've been, we're going to get a revised I've been flash drive, packet. correct? Where, wait, wait. where there were changes Meg, are red Meg, line. Meg, what are you saying? Sorry. I would like an entire hard copy, but where there are changes are red lines. So I don't want to just get pages that are red line. No, understood. It, it's a full chapter. So if, if there was only one word that changed in chapter two, you'd still get all of chapter two. But if there were no changes in chapter three, chapter three would not be included. So I don't want that. I, I need the entire... Copy, Meg, didn't you get a, a, about three weeks ago? William had hard copies and flash drives of the entire revised DEIS, not the appendices, but the revised. And he asked each of the board members whether they wanted a flash drive or a hard copy. Did you at that point get yes. a hard copy? Yes. So then the only thing new now is the red line. Okay, that's fine. I can do that and I will refer to my other hard copy for where there's a blank. Right. So, but aren't, is providing additional flash drives updated with the appendices, correct? Correct. But yes, he's, those okay. are the, have already been delivered. That. William said he has those flash drives. He, William, he you have those? Yes, yes, I do. So I will bring, I'll be bringing those to you as soon as. Um, Mr. Geoffrey drops off the, the three additional hard copies as requested. So you'll get well, a hard I think it's copy. Gonna be, it's going to be five hard copies, one for each member of the board. Fair enough. I have three. I need two more. Right. So, William, you don't have to deliver mine. You just call me. I'll walk over and pick it up. Yeah, that's what I said. To, that's what I said to William earlier today that he just, that the, those of us on the board could probably arrange to pick it up. And if you can't, then William could drop it off. Fair enough. Okay, um, so that takes care of the technical details. I think next we should have our consultant, Ashley, um, present her findings and then we will hear from the applicant. So we reviewed the revised DEIS um, against the ACARAF memo that was dated January 17th, 2020, which was our technical comments on the original uh, draft that was submitted in the end of December, 2019. Uh, we've provided it in a, in a comments and responses format so that you can see how each comment was or was not addressed. Uh, the majority of the comments were addressed. 
Uh, there were some that were not, for the most part, the ones that were not, I would characterize it as minor. Um, text edits, uh, I don't think we're asking for any additional analysis to be included. The most significant comments were related to the traffic chapter where we asked for some additional information to be included, as well as in the hazardous materials chapter. Um, there was a summary of a phase one ESA in the chapter itself, but the phase one was not included in the appendix. They did provide the phase two ESA. Uh, so what we're asking for is a copy of the actual phase one ESA, which has all of the, um, the, the background support so we can determine whether or not the phase two was based, what it was based on and whether or not they did the appropriate sampling. Ash, uh, Ashley, before you continue or anybody else, Michael, I asked you a question during our work session. Do you remember what that question was? I do, Doug. And uh, I believe the question was whether or not they could put forward this expansion application before the board um, if they were not in compliance with their original variance. Right. Okay. And I think, I think the answer is right here within the code. Um, if we look at 342-92. All right, give me a second. All right. Um, the specific question that, that brought that up, and I, I can wait till Doug gets back, um, I did find some additional information on that in the DEIS um, and it, that's included in my memo and I can I can touch on that. All right, under uh, section 342-92 of the code. Go ahead, Michael, I got it. All right, it uh, looks like subsection D. D. Existing Exist violations, you have to have clear proof by the applicant of extenuating circumstances satisfactory to the Board of Appeals. No variance or special permit shall be granted where there is an existing violation of this chapter against the property in question. It answers my question. So, um, when you brought that up at the last meeting, I think your question was whether or not uh, they only had 25 parking spaces on the site and the original variance no, 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 required 52? No. The original application submitted, they were to provide 89 parking spaces. They agreed to provide 58. 52. 52, whatever. But you only had 25 and you're still only proposing 25. So the question is, okay, where are the other 27 spaces to go, according, go along according to what your original application was? Because if you only provided 25, it, it's not in compliance with your original application that was your original variance that was granted by this board. So the question I have is, how can this board proceed on this application, even reviewing the DEIS, if it's not in compliance with the, existing, with the existing variance that was granted previous? So William actually circulated the approved plans, um, I think last week, and I compared those against the plans that are included, the existing conditions plans that are included in the DEIS, and the approved plans um, from 2013 show a number of spaces that are located indoors. They account, they count some indoor spaces towards the total of 52 spaces. There and are that spaces. Yes, there are 52 spaces, including and some the indoor spaces. Certify that there were 52 spaces, Frank. There's a certificate of occupancy that's been issued, and we've also uh, compared that with the existing conditions plan, as Miss Lai indicated, as well as counted on the aerial as well. I would also like to uh, advise the board that under the the the, uh, the village law. The Zoning Board of Appeals is without the authority to withhold or, with, or, or is, not uh, is not permitted to stop an application from being reviewed if there is a notice of violation or violation that's been issued. There's an attorney general's opinion to that effect. I can certainly provide that. I reached out to Mr. Hartman earlier in the week. Um, I can certainly provide that, notwithstanding the property is compliant as it relates to the 52 spaces. You, you have a certificate of occupancy from the village of Amaranic that says you are in compliance with the variance application 982013? The, the building would not be permitted to be operated or open without a certificate of occupancy. 
Frank? They have a... I, I am not aware of the, uh, the parking space, you know, whether they have the 52 or not. Um, and I didn't check to see if they have a CO right now, to be honest with you. Okay. All right, I'll, I'll go along as long as I get a CFO provided. And how did you ascertain uh, and actually who went in to do the inspection to uh, authorize the CFO? I'd like to see if there are any notes in there that said they went inside the building and counted 27 parking spaces inside for a total of 52. Okay, I wasn't even- Not all of them were shown inside. Excuse me? Not all of the parking spaces were shown inside, just a I few of the parking 20... spaces. I said 27 on the inside because you only had 25 on the outside. No, there's more than that on the outside. There were more than 25 on the outside? Absolutely. There's 40 on the outside. So you had 40 on the outside and 12 on the inside? That's my understanding, sir. Yep. Figure 2-5 in the DEIS, which is the existing conditions plan, shows 52 spaces existing. And I think... Um, Hold Some of the confusion. Hold on, hold on, hold on a second, please. Sure. Okay. I am looking at out of their DEIS. Figure I two dash five. I dash seven. Off street parking spaces required 137. Existing 25. Proposed 25. Variance 112. Right here. I believe that those numbers are transposed, and we can certainly correct that. As I understand that there needs to be revisions to this DIS pursuant to Ms. Lai's memo that was received this afternoon. I, and one of the other things that was in in my comment memo is it there does seem to be some confusion about the 25. I think the 25 was meant uh, in relation to the self storage facility alone, and it, that was referring to the parking spaces that were immediately adjacent to the self storage facility. Uh, as opposed to looking at the full site and the spaces that are occupied by the other users on the site. It, it was confusing in the way that it was worded in the DEIS. It okay, needs well, to be changed. I, you know, I, 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 I'd like to get clarification on exactly how many spaces did the storage facility going to take up? How many spaces are associated with the existing other buildings on the lot? And where are those spaces? Well, the existing conditions plan provides that for you, Mr. Dunaway, um, as it relates to um, how the, the spaces are laid out in relation to the other buildings. Uh, the other buildings are proposed to be demolished. There were variances that were granted. So I don't know that we can address all of your questions, but we can hey, certainly well, provide it, it, It's something that's going to come up in the end, depending upon certainly... how this application moves forward. Well, I, I, I respectfully disagree with you on that, but we can certainly, we can work with Mr. Tavolacci to address right. the, the, the outstanding question. And I can That's certainly fine. work with Mr. Hartman as it relates to this board's authority and, and require an obligation to continue review of this DIS. All right, no, I, all right. But the other question I have is in relationship to this application is I am looking at all of these items and I'm wondering where you're showing me where trucks are gonna be coming in to make initial deliveries into the storage areas that you have. I didn't see anything calling for truck traffic. Well, again, when we get to the, the, where we are right now in the stage of review is the completeness review. We are not uh, addressing the substance of the application. We are not addressing okay. the variances of the application. When we get past whether or not this DIS is complete, when we get to the substance of the application, we can certainly go through all of that, but we do have a, a a traffic uh, 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 and parking chapter of the DEIS. To, if there's additional information that you'll acquire at some time in the future, yeah, I was, I, I was going to provide that. We have four yeah. loading spaces where there are none today. So okay. we can address those substantive comments in the future, but this is not the appropriate procedural step right now. All right. All right. So go ahead, Ashley. Um, just scrolling through. So uh, there's a number of comments in the in the memo where they were just partially addressed. So those are clarified, and we'd like to see those revised. Um, but as I said earlier, the, the largest issue was that we're in the traffic chapter as well as the we need a, to see the phase one ESA. Um, uh -huh. So at this point, it, I would recommend that it, it well it's not it's not complete until these items are addressed. 
Um, the other item that I wanted to go over with the board is, is the February 7th memo, which was a summary of the board's comments at their meeting in January and on February 6th. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things I, I could do would be to go through the document and do a comments and response to that memo in a similar fashion to what we did for the AKRF memo, if the board would find that helpful. Yes, I think, I think we need to have that because those were the board's determinations of what we felt additional information was needed or otherwise. And so um, the applicant should have addressed those comments as well as AKRF's comments. So yes, we would like you to tell us whether or not he addressed our comments um, as well, because if he didn't, okay. he's got to do that. And if he did that, great, then he doesn't have to do anything else. So okay. yes, please do a, and we would, if you could do that, Ashley, please, sorry, before the meeting on the 16th, um, then we would be able to really discuss it because I mean, I think at this point, the board members are a little, um, we don't have all the information we need to, to determine if it was complete. Right. If I were to get it to you by um, Thursday, the, the 12th, would that be enough time for the board? I mean, we could do with it. That's a week from now. So um, I think that's okay. Board members that work for you. I, I realize it's not ideal, but we are a little tight here. So. Um, I mean, 12th is okay. Okay, Greta, Meg. I don't, Meg is, you're, you're just. I'm here. I'm okay. Here. That's fine with me. Okay, so then that would be fine. Thanks, Ashley. Okay. Okay, so. Um, so uh, Ashley, you're finished with your comments tonight? Yes, so just to go over the process. So at, at the meeting on the 16th, we would go through the memo. Um, the board would suggest any edits to the memo and then the board could provide those comments to the applicant declaring the document incomplete. If you feel that the comments are um, minor in nature, uh, you could declare the document conditionally complete and then what we would do is ask for a proof copy to review prior to going into publication and setting a public hearing, um, or you could ask for another round of review. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, Mr. Jeffrey, do you uh, wish to say anything? Uh, Jeff, sorry, it's now time for you to just to, uh, to to say what you want to say on the thank you, Madam on, this, Chair. on the completeness and the DEIS. Um, we, we just received Ms. Lai's memo this afternoon. Our team has uh, not had the opportunity to uh, digest it or, or, or speak about it in, in, with each other. I do note that there's a reference in that memorandum to a Kellard Sessions memo. Um, I if there is such a memo, I would ask that we be provided with a copy of that as well so that we can um, determine if there are any additional items that we need to address in that document. Um, we look forward to uh, Ms. Ms. Lai's memo, uh, which she promised you by the 12th. I would ask if that can be released to us at the same time so that we can keep this process moving and that we can uh, move this project along and get you the information that you're looking for in a timely manner. I, that's fine, uh, Ashley. So when you distribute that memo to us, please also distribute it to- Yes, uh, I will. The applicant. All right. Um, is there anything else that anybody wants to say on the this the, this com, this this um, on the completeness issue? Otherwise, we're just going to wait until the yeah. the uh, work session on the sixteenth yeah. to discuss it. All right, Mr. Joffrey, you're going to clarify that variance with respect to the off-street parking to reflect actual. I, I can I can reach out to Mr. Tavalacci and to Mr. Hartman and to Ms. Lai to make sure that we all are in, in alignment with with respect. Right, because to right now you the way it reads is you want a variance for 112 spaces. That, that that's not accurate, uh, but that but we will make sure that it's clarified and that right. there is no confusion in any of the language. Okay, thank you. My pleasure. Since we have this calendar for a public hearing, I will ask if there's anybody from the public who wishes to speak on solely on the point of whether or not the revised draft EIS is complete. If there's anyone, please raise your hand. Madam Chair, no one has indicated that they wish to speak. Okay, so then I think we should close the public hearing on the completeness of the application and um, 
our discussion will then be held on November 16th. Does that work? Anybody, any board members have any other, any other thing, or if that's okay with the board members, then I'll, I'll make board. a motion to close okay. the public hearing. So moved. All right, so I'll second your motion, Doug. I'll second your motion, Doug. Um, okay. Meg? Yes. Greta? Greta. Yes. Abby? Yep. Uh, Doug? Yes. I vote yes as well. So the public hearing on this application is closed and we will be discussing, the board will be discussing the application on November 16th. Um, are you adjourning it to another date or are you closing it and requiring it to be re-noticed? No, we're just where the public, we're, the, pu the completeness doesn't need a public hearing. No, it doesn't. So but they will need a public, a public hearing, hearing once it's accepted. Except for additional submittal if, um, if the applicant is going to submit anything, that's okay. If you have to submit anything, that's okay. So any submittals made by the applicant or by our consultant, we will that is open. That's not closed. It's just that the public speaking. Miss, yes, at Mr. Joffrey, you had something. Yes. Yeah, so, so Ms. Lyman raises a good point in, in terms of whether or not you're going to keep this public hearing open. We incur the, we incur the expense of re-noticing, or do you want to wait till you make a determination of completeness when there's a 30-day comment period for the public and hold a public hearing at that time? We've noticed that tonight, based upon a memo, a letter that we did receive, that there was the potential completeness. So it might make sense if you could adjourn this date certain so that we don't have to re-notice and incur the additional expense. Okay. The only thing that was no, I don't know what your notice said. The only, the, so just um, Ashley, if you would just confirm a couple of things. When the DEIS is determined to be complete and they publish it, we then have a public hearing on the DEIS. That's but correct. at this point, the public hearing was only on the completeness. Right, not on the DEIS. But that's correct. It, and, so and there is no requirement for a public hearing on completeness. completeness. Okay, so what so, did so your- that, That's what I would request. So- What did your notice say? What did your was, notice- our, our notice tried to be all encompassing because there was some confusion as it relates to, so we did notice the completeness. So we're, we're covered and in, in a public hearing is not required at this point. What I would recommend and I would- I well, would wait, well, wait, before you recommend anything, let's get the facts down. What did your notice, your public, your notice for public hearing say? It was, uh, I don't have, let me see if I have it in front of me. Um, if you bear with me one moment. But I believe that the notice was drafted to address the completeness of the DEIS and allow public comment on the DEIS. But, but we're not having our hearing on the DEIS. I, I understand. And, and that's why I mentioned there was confusion with the letter that we did receive where the letter indicated that the DEIS was de deemed complete which we didn't believe was accurate because the lead agency, your board did not make that determination. So we tried to be more all encompassing to cover it, even though it was not required. And at this point, um, we, we still need to have the DIS be deemed complete. We, at that point, then there needs to be a circulation and then you could have a public hearing on the DIS. Correct. So the question that I have, which is a question for, um, and I, maybe we have to make this a contingent closing. The question that I have is, what did your notice actually say? So, uh, Michael, if you would review their notice, make this a legal determination, if you would review the notice, which, he, which um, Mr. Jaffe needs to get to you, and determine whether the public hearing was a public hearing solely on the completeness issue or was actually adequate to serve as the notice of the public hearing on the DEIS itself. And if it was not, he will have to notice. It's not a re-notice, it's just a separate notice. Indeed. Um, so um, the, um, Mr. Murphy says that he sent, who is the applicant, uh, the owner of the property says that he sent Mr. Jeffrey the notice. So if you would please read that to the board, maybe we can solve it right now. Yep, I'm uh, just trying to open it right now. So this is, please take notice that the Zoning Board of Appeals of the Village of Meredith, New York as lead agency will hold a public hearing on Thursday, November 5th. It gives the information with respect to um, 
submitted by East Coast North Properties in accordance with Article 8 of the New York State Environmental Conservation Law and regulations promulgated thereunder at 6 NYCRR Part 617 collectively secret on the following proposed type one action for which a positive declaration of significance has been adopted. Application number 15A 2018 East Coast North Properties 416 Waverly Avenue provides the section block and lot for variances to expand provides all of the variances that are subject to the application. A copy of the resubmitted DIS is on file with the Village of Mamaroneck Planning Department and is available to any interested parties for review. Please direct all questions or written comments from the resubmitted DIS to the contact person. Um, Mr. Uh, Michael, do you think that is adequate to serve as a public hearing notice for the DEIS? which is required by by statute. Yeah, at first blush, it, it seems to, to serve it to me. Okay. And again, the um, operative language is to consider the resubmitted draft environmental impact statement submitted and then all of the other information. Um, it doesn't say anything about completeness. Okay, so it's a, I'd say it's a little vague. I'm not sure it's like, um, okay. And again, so, we, don't, we don't need a public hearing on the completeness. The public right. hearing will be on the DIS, which is why it's noticed that way. And it lists all the variances. Okay, so then I think that we should not be closing the public hearing. We will just adjourn the public hearing until, um, I guess it'll be the next meeting, the December meeting. Well, uh, wait, it will be adjourned tentatively till the December meeting because we may not, have a, it may not be deemed complete at that point. So I don't know what we're going to do. I guess if we can adjourn it open-ended and we are adjourning it open-ended, except that we're gonna to have to make sure that notice is given. Do you have a sign on the property, yes. um, Mr. Jeffrey? Yes. Okay, and that and, sign and is gonna have to be- if you, if you, I'm sorry, if you, if you, it will update the sign, but if you adjourn to the next meeting and then- We're not adjourning the public hearing to the next meeting because the next meeting, Oh, right. The next meeting is the work session. Correct. If you adjourn it to your December meeting, then you could open it and continue it at that point if you're still not ready. Um, we don't even have to open it in order to continue it. So um, we don't usually open it to continue it. Um, we just, um, we can adjourn it to the next meeting. Okay, so we'll adjourn the public hearing to the next meeting. Um, we may or may not be opening the public, reopening the public hearing at the next meeting. Do, do we need to vote on that since we had voted to close? Yeah, I think we need to re-vote because we did actually vote and he didn't miss, the applicant didn't make his comment until we were done with the vote. So- um, And if that could just be to a date certain of December 3rd? Um, yes, but I think before we do that, we need to re-vote. So yes, let yes, me, yes, I'll make a corrected motion. Um, I want to make a corrected motion, which is to, I think we have to reopen the public hearing, honestly, since we did vote to close it. Um, although I'm not sure if we voted, we finished voting. I know we had a, a motion and a second and I started taking a vote. Um, and I think every almost everybody voted. So just to be clear, we are going to reopen if necessary and otherwise just um, make a new motion to reopen and the motion would be to continue the public hearing to December 3rd, pending a determination of completeness of the DEIS. If it is complete, then on December 3rd, we will have the public hearing on the DEIS. If we do not determine the public here, the DEIS to be complete, then uh, we'll just continue the public hearing. So that is my combined motion to reopen and then continue. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Um, Greta? Yes. Doug? You're on mute. Doug, you're mute. Oh. I, I, I am off mute and yes. Okay. Abby? Yes. And Meg? Yes. Okay. I vote yes. So that is what we have done. Um, and continue this public hearing. Thank you very much. Um, we appreciate it. And uh, we certainly wish you all continued safety and well-being. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so that ends the public hearings for tonight. Um, I think at this point, we are going to go into executive, se executive session to discuss personnel issues. 
Do I need a motion to go into, do we need a vote to vote to go into executive session? I never remember. Mike, where'd he go? He left. Oh no, Mike, do we need a vote to go into executive yeah. session? Okay, I make a motion to go into I'm executive session. I'm sorry, Robin, you just spoke quickly and I'm sorry, I wasn't paying attention. Did you say, we also have to give the reason why we're going into executive session, perhaps you did. I did, I so I will make, I'm making a motion now to go into executive session to discuss personnel issues. All right, so. We need I'll a second. second I vote. second the motion to go into executive session. Wait, wait, are we closing or, no, we can't close it. The public hearing is closed. So okay. there is no more public hearing. We will go into the separate meeting in order to do executive session after which we will come back to this meeting um, in order to continue. All so, right, so I'm gonna leave this one open and just open the other. You can't act. open two Zooms at the same time. You have to close. Zoom doesn't allow you to have two Zooms open. I'll tell you what, I'll just phone in. Um, okay, so the rest of us should go into that. Oh, wait, we need to vote on this. So don't, uh, Meg seconded I, I, I'm here. So, I haven't left yet. So, so, oh, so yeah, so uh, on the motion that Meg seconded, that I made and Mo Meg seconded, yeah, you're voting yes? Yes. Yeah. Okay, Abby? Yes. Greta? Yes. Uh, Meg? Yes. And I vote yes as well. Okay, we are now going into executive session. All right, so I'm going to mute and cut and the everyone. video off. Thank you, Ashley. So we're leaving this, right? Yeah, you leave this and you'll have to go into the other one.